All right. Hello, everybody. I'm Garrett Dash Nelson. I'm the president head curator at the Leventhal Map and Education Center. And you are tuned in today for our evening program with the Ashland Public Library, Ashland by Map. Um, I'm going to invite two of my colleagues uh, to the screen and, and welcome them. Uh, and then we'll get started uh, just a little bit after that. First, I have joining me Megan Nally, who's on our staff at the Map and Education Center. Megan is one of our gallery attendants and our public engagement coordinator. Hi, Megan. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. You can see Megan if you have a chance to come to our current exhibition, which is free six days a week at the Central Library in Copley Square called Bending Lines, Maps and Data from Distortion to Deception. Um, come visit us. You can always get more information at leventhalmap.org. And our co-presenters tonight, uh, really the folks who invited us to do this program, uh, is Mina Jane from the Ashland Public Library. Hi. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. As I was saying earlier, I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library. And it's not just us bringing you here. It's the Ashland Historical Society. We're very pleased to partner with them on this. And we're so excited to hear what you have to say about Ashland by map. Great. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Mina. Uh, Mina will be joining us at the end uh, or in the second half of the program as we get to questions as well. Um, and again, Megan will be, be on the broadcast as well. And you can come visit both of us at the Central Library at any time. Um, for now, I'll say bye to Mina and Megan and we'll dive right in. So uh, I want to say a couple things before we get started. Um, first, uh, before we begin this program, I want to take note of the complicated and contested threads that are woven through historical geography. And that includes difficult stories that we neither can nor should ignore. The place that we call Boston, where I'm broadcasting from, is the ancestral and current home to indigenous peoples, including the Mashpee and Aquina Wampanoag tribes, the Nipmuc nations, and descendants of the Massachusetts people. Copley Square, where the Central Library is located, sits on top of a filled tidal estuary that once featured some of the most advanced marine agricultural techniques in North America. The maps that are in our collections at the Boston Public Library bear witness not only to histories of colonial expropriation, but also to subsequent conflicts ranging from labor struggles to racial segregation. In some cases, the maps that we have don't simply document these stories, but they actually played a role in making them happen in the first place. And through all of the programs that we do at the Map and Education Center, we encourage visitors to consider how these histories are still very much alive in the present day. A little bit about the center and our collections and the work that we do that I've just alluded to. Um, the Leventhal Map and Education Center is an independent nonprofit located at the Central Library in Copley Square. It's a public-private relationship uh, between our center and the city of Boston. And we steward one of the most important map collections in North of America, with more than a quarter million maps, atlases, globes, and other geographic objects that tell the history, present, and future of Boston and the region. We encourage visitors to, uh, to come to the library six days a week to see our free exhibition center or to stop by for research or reference appointments at any time. We work not only with historic collections, but also with present day maps, digital data, and geographic information of all kinds. And we always welcome folks from all walks of life. We consider research to be something that everybody can and should do um, with geographic collections. Also, as an independent nonprofit, we rely on contributions from visitors and viewers like you to support these free programs in areas ranging from scholarly research and public talks to K-12 education and the preservation of our collections. If you enjoy today's event, consider visiting leventhalmap.org donate. You can donate in just a few seconds online and even a small donation helps support our free public mission. So in today's talk, I'm gonna walk you through some of the most interesting ways of doing historic research with maps with a focus on Ashland. Um, looking at the history, the past of Ashland, how it's revealed through maps, and some of the ways that we can dive into map collections to examine these kinds of stories. Now, a couple of caveats up front. We do a lot of these talks in a lot of different locations and neither I nor the Leventhal staff are 
local history experts about every single place in Massachusetts. So oftentimes, you know, you might have a question about where was this building or, you know, what was located here in 1750? And the chances are I probably don't know the specific answer to that question. But what I'm here to do is to encourage you to think about maps as complicated historic documents that are sometimes really great for answering specific questions like that one. What was this building in 1750 or who owned this land in 1820? But more often than not, maps open up questions. They pose ways of thinking about the past. They help us think about spatial relationships, land and landscapes and communities. And so those are some of the themes that I'm going to highlight today by walking through our digital collections, as well as some maps that are available online from a couple of other institutions. Um, I'm sharing a browser window today because I'm going to be walking you through stuff that you can do online um, from home. But only a small fraction of the maps in our collection and in most other collections are digitized. And so it's always a, a good thing to remember that the, the sort of collections are far bigger than the, the, the online iceberg makes it seem. Um, and we always welcome you to visit our research center to dive more into any of these questions. Our website, leventhalmap.org, is really a treasure trove of resources for geographic research online. And from this site, you can find our digital collections, you can find support for researchers, um, you can find articles and information about our maps, book programs, and uh, all, all, all other sort of jumping off points for uh, map-based research. From the collections tab of our uh, main website, that's the best place to get started looking for maps in our collections. Now, we have one of the most significant map collections in North America. It's particularly strong for Boston and for Massachusetts. Um, those are the areas for which we're best equipped to support research. But we have maps literally of everywhere in the world um, on different topics from different times, some of which are historically significant, some of which are a bit more prosaic and mundane, but which still open up interesting questions about geographic research. We like to make research online as easy as possible. So for instance, you can search our digital collections right here. If I look for Ashland, <clears throat> I get these quick set of results, some of which are not Ashland, Massachusetts. This first one is Ashland in Wisconsin. But the second one is a map, or rather a bird's eye view, that appeared in the advertising for this event and is one of the most intriguing uh, objects in our collection about Ashland in the past. Some of you, maybe members of the Historical Society, may be familiar with, with this map. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a dive into it. On our digital collections page, which you're looking at now, you can zoom in to any one of our maps into really fine detail so close that you can actually see like the ink pressing on the page. And if there's tears in the paper or marks on the uh, marks on the edge of the paper, you can get that close detailed in. I'm showing you just some of the artifacts here that are reminders that these are paper collections um, or print collections. Um, and they're replicas of, of, of objects that are at the central library somewhere. What we're looking at here is what we call a bird's eye view. So it's a type of map that's drawn from an, an oblique perspective, um, almost as if, if a bird were looking down on Ashland. This one happens to be made in 1878. And it's, uh, it's executed by a company called OH Bailey, which is very, very popular and important maker of bird's eye view, especially of Massachusetts at this time. There's many, many towns that have Bailey bird's eye views drawn of them. Now, bird's eye views in the 19th century are really popular for a number of reasons. One of them is nobody had ever seen what it looked like, what Ashland looked like from the sky before. Remember, there's no airplanes. There's no really meaningful balloons. Um, People, that, and, and there's no tall mountains right next to Ashland either that you could climb up to and get this sort of a view. So the only way that you could kind of geographically imagine a town or a city at this point in the 19th century was by looking at a map like this one. So bird's eye views like this one were commissioned as objects of civic pride. They were oftentimes paid for by the sort of leading citizens of a town, industrialists, uh, bankers, clergy people, um, elected officials to sort of brag and show, show off what the town was all about. They would have hung in important buildings. 
they were rendered really beautifully um, in order to, uh, to to provide a kind of visual portrait of, of a place in the 19th century when boom towns and urban expansion were really in their high phase in the United States. So I'm going to take you into a few details of this map of Ashland in 1878, though again, reminding you that many of you may, may well be uh, uh, more expert in your particular knowledge of the local history than I am. One of the unique things about these bird's eye view maps is they show uh, buildings in elevation. So you can see that the buildings here are, are, are shown from a perspective that includes at least two of their sides, windows, steeples, details like uh, roofs and crenellation. You see people walking on the streets, horse-drawn carriages. And it's an interesting way to think about how did the, the city think about itself? What were its important places at the time the map was made? A couple buildings are labeled with letters. Um, those letters are given uh, in a key down at the bottom. Uh, oops, wrong side of the map. Um, so you see these kind of classic civic centers, town hall, central house, four different churches, public school, high school, and then the Tilton Company, manufacturer of boots and shoes. Tilton Company also gets this really nice elevation of their mill over here, which is probably a hint that the Tilton Company probably had some hand in making or paying for this map in the first place. Now, thinking again back to some of what I said at the very beginning, and a point that's really important to make when you're looking at any kind of map is that because maps simplify the world, they inherently leave things out. So what are some of the things that you aren't seeing on this map? You certainly don't see hardly any markers of native presence, even though in the 19th century and today, um, there's uh, the, the, the land that we now call Ashland, uh, the longtime ancestral homeland of peoples who predate the, the creation of this map. Certainly, if you're trying to tell a story of Ashland's industrial expansion and change, you want to show things like a busy puffing railroad with a big plume of smoke coming out the back. And these look like to me like lumber or building materials staged along the railway line. And you want to leave out things like any evidence that the land might have been owned or occupied by other people in the past. As I was looking at this map, I noticed a couple kind of interesting things. Um, just as a 19th century historian, you see on Granite Street, this row of houses here, which I'm quite certain must have been factory workers, laborers, houses um, built for the adjacent mills. Um, you can see the route of the Sudbury River and the mill dam that powered these mills, including Tilton. Um, and then the, the Angier Mill, uh, I, I, I believe this one, was, that this one is, though somebody surely can correct me if I'm wrong about that. Um, you also see the development of, of this sort of railroad economy with a passenger station in the middle, the Boston and Albany line, which when it arrived in Ashland, of course, transformed the town and heralded its kind of industrial expansion. Um, in 19th century towns, you very often find things like a hotel building uh, across from the station or near to the station. That's where we get uh, phrases like wrong side of the tracks from um, back when the railroad line would have been the pr primary way of getting into and out of town. And remember the, the sort of invitation at the beginning to think about how maps open questions just as much as they answer them. First of all, I should draw your attention at the very beginning. This map happens to have north at the bottom. So if you're disoriented, here's the rail line, here's Front Street. Um, uh, and here's the center of town on the south side of the rail line. So we've got we've got north at the bottom. North at the top, of course, is just a convenient fiction. Uh, there's no reason that north has to be at the top or anywhere else in a map. But again, returning to this question of sort of what kind of questions does do maps open? You can look at all sorts of things on this map and wonder about what was going on. Here's clearly another mill complex lower on the Sudbury River. And you might think a little bit about what's the relationship between the mills that were being built at this time, this sort of vacant land that was still rural agricultural land, so nearby, um, and what was what was changing, what was happening in the cultural economy of a place like Ashland when the railroad has recently arrived, mills have gone up, and yet you still have this close relationship with the agricultural economy of Massachusetts on the periphery. 
you can think of in some ways as the of the like the roots out of the map or roots into other questions. Was there what 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 were the consequences of having the branch line to Hopkinton uh, branching away from the main Albany line right here? Who lived in some of these buildings? Are these buildings still ones that we could match up to extant buildings today? Some of them you might recognize with particular architectural features that would suggest that's probably a building that's been there since 1878 or earlier. Some of them have certainly been entirely replaced with new developments. So this bird's eye view is one of the more interesting ones of Ashland proper in our collection. Um, it's actually one of the only ones that shows Ashland, Massachusetts specifically. So another thing to think about with maps is scale. So when you ask, for instance, do you have any maps that show Ashland? Well, we have maps that show the world and Ashland is on the world. So yes, <laughs> uh, when you think about what are you looking for in a map, you have to think not only about what's it showing, but also what scale is it showing at? What sorts of features did a map maker choose to include? So again, a bird's eye view is showing feature details about, for instance, architecture and um, businesses that would not be shown on a hydrographic map or uh, you know a, a road survey planning map. Um, what the map maker chooses to show, what the map maker chooses to leave out is a major theme of the exhibition that's in our gallery right now called Bending Lines. Here's a map of Middlesex County that was made in 1850 or roughly the middle of the 19th century. County maps are actually much more common um, in the middle 19th century than town scale maps. When we go back all the way to the 18th century, we actually have very, very few town scale maps. The few town scale maps that we do have primarily either government uh, boundary marker maps or surveys of, of land for sale. County maps were pretty common and popular by the middle 19th century, especially at, the, a at large scales like this one. And we can see Ashland, of course, here in Middlesex County with some other details. This map doesn't show any buildings or settlement, um, but it does show us uh, uh, major roads. It shows the relationship of Ashland to its neighboring towns. Um, and this map also shows the Boston and Albany rail line very soon after it was laid through Ashland. So this is one of the earlier maps that shows the route of that railroad line. This is Henry Walling's map of Middlesex County. It's really a, a pretty amazing document. It's enormous. Um, Henry Walling is an important Massachusetts cartographer of the middle 19th century, is commissioned to make many, many um, state level and county level maps, uh, not only of Massachusetts, but of other New England states as well. Um, and Walling's map is, this is a, a, of a kind that's very common for middle 19th century maps where it's, it does include quite a bit more detail. So we're zooming into Ashland Center here. It's gonna take a second for the detail of this map to load on my screen. You can see that this map actually details buildings. It details major property owners or inhabitants. So the names of um, people like E. Brown, W. Stiles, S. Hauer, you can see features like the Congregational Church. Uh, this map is so big that uh, when you zoom in, we actually do lose a bit of detail because we couldn't, we can't photograph it um, at at that level of of detail and scale. But it's a class classic example where coming in to see the map in person would would um, yield an even more kind of rich and detailed perspective. But here's Ashland again with the the uh, the railroad running through. Um, the, the, again, the Boston Worcester, uh, as it was called before it became the Boston and Albany. Um, and you can see that basically the development uh, of the center of Ashland that we see just a few decades later in that O.H. Bailey bird's eye view. So I want to take a pause here just to note all of what you've been seeing so far is in our digital collections portal. Um, this is a collect, uh, portal where we have about 10,000 of our best maps digitized. Um, you can search the digital collections portal either by simple terms like Middlesex County and bring up maps that way. You can also make advanced searches if you want, for instance, to search Middlesex, um, but only between 1830 and 1870, you can search the same way. I also want to note that 
our digital collections portal is part of a much larger uh, federation of digital collections in Massachusetts called Digital Commonwealth that's hosted at the Boston Public Library. So everything that we have is also in digital, digital Commonwealth. Here's that OH Bailey map that I just showed you, the very same thing. But Digital Commonwealth also includes dozens of other institutions' holdings, including photographs and newspapers. Um, and so you can find, for instance, photographs of Ashland here. I just searched for Ashland Mass. If I filter for photographs, there's a really interesting collection of, of photographs I noticed uh, in looking here uh, about the building of the Hopkinton Dam and the Sudbury Water Department. Um, I'm not going to go into those because this isn't a, for a talk about photographs, um, but just noting that the Digital Commonwealth uh, portal is a really great place to follow up on some of those questions that might begin from a map. So again, you might be looking at a map and notice, let's say, the name of a building or name of somebody's house, and you might go from there to Digital Commonwealth to see if you can find photographs or other records um, that might give you interesting additional detail. We've also created a number of sort of special one-off um, digital maps of Massachusetts. And I want to show a couple of them here. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this is a map that's based on uh, a set of atlases that were created in the early 20th century, showing every what's called town corner in Massachusetts. So towns in Massachusetts are defined essentially by a series of points that when you connect them form the outline of the town. In the early 20th century, the Commonwealth orders that these are all surveyed and bound into books. Um, we actually have those books. We haven't digitized them. The State Library of Massachusetts has digitized them. And so we drew on data, uh, both modern data used by the State Department of Transportation, as well as some of those digital collections at the State Library to look at these town corner maps um, and they're, they're interesting because they show really, really great detail from the earliest 20th century about the areas around town boundaries. So let's go over to Ashland here. You can see each of these points is on one of the edges of Ashland. If you bring it up, here we're looking at one of the corners of Ashland that's been digitized here. So these atlases have all of the corners and you can see they've been surveyed in really great detail. So we're looking at the Ashland, Holliston, Hopkinton border here. You can see details like Cold Spring Brook, the specific property owners, cultivated land, uh, forest lands, uh, a marsh uh, where Cold Spring Brook uh, ran down into the Ashland Reservoir here. Uh, these unfortunately only cover the edges of towns, which make them useful primarily if the, if the place that you're interested in is at the edge of a town. Um, but I'll, I'll just go over here. This is this is that original Atlas book, which is available. I'm now in the digital collections of the State Library of Massachusetts. Um, and this is the, 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 the boundaries of Ashland, as well as about half a dozen other uh, towns in the area. If you were to open this up, you'd find those same uh, town corner maps in detail. Another one of our most important and interesting collections at the MAP Center is a set of maps that we call real estate and fire insurance atlases. So starting around the time of the US Civil War, um, a series of map, maker, map making firms begin creating incredibly detailed maps of American cities for a couple of purposes, which maybe seem less important today, uh, but were really kind of big money at the time. One of those was the underwriting of fire insurance policies. So fire insurers needed to know what buildings were made of, who owned those buildings, how close together they were, um, in order to write fire insurance policies. American cities were burning down all the time at this time uh, before the advent of modern fire uh, safety uh, construction materials. Um, the other reason that these atlases were made is essentially like the the predecessors of uh, like a real estate listing service or Zillow um, so that um, speculators and buyers uh, could have detail about who own buildings and, and where future development might occur. These atlases are amazing. They're incredibly bulky and difficult to work with in their physical form. So what we did is we took a hundred atlases of Boston and its immediate surrounding suburbs. And we transform them into this tool that we call Atlascope. 
What Alloscope does is allows you to layer these historic atlases right on top of a modern map and to compare them across years. So just by way of example, we're looking here at 700 Boylston Street, Copley Square, where the central library is. There is a modern map of, of Boston. You can see the Boston Public Library. Even our, our, our famous statue of Bacant and Infant Fawn is, is labeled on this modern map. And then we're looking through that modern map here to an 1874 map. In 1874, the Central Library wasn't there yet. In fact, the Back Bay neighborhood where we're located was just being laid out. And in Atlas Scope, you can walk through time in these historic atlases. I'm not gonna go to every one of these years, but just give you a, a kind of example. Here's 1890, just after the library has been built. And now you can see the level of detail that's available in these atlases. So you can see building names, you can see lot sizes. So 65,000 <clears throat> square foot lot size here um, for the BPL. See Harvard Medical School used to be our neighbor. These colors of buildings correspond to their building materials. So we're a stone building, we're surrounded by pink brick buildings. If you were to go to other, um, you know, working class neighborhood, residential neighborhoods, you'd see a lot of yellow, which were wood frame buildings. And you can see all sorts of detail. If you zoom way in here, a, a, biz, uh, a property owner is named E. Carroll, 2,800 square foot property that had a stone facade. You can see how it's brown in the front here, pink in the back. That was at 299 Boylston Street. There's an incredible, incredible level of detail on these fire insurance atlases. And because we've spatially index them all this in this way, you can kind of walk through time and see the city change. So here's 1890, here's 1898, buildings have changed, they've gone up, they've come down. We can walk through all the way to 1938, where there's been even more transformation in the city. <clears throat> now I'm show, I'm very well aware that I'm not showing you Ashland here. And the reason is that the, uh, this process of transforming these atlases is incredibly time consuming. And so we've begun uh, with Boston and our immediate neighbors. Again, there's about a hundred atlases in here. Um, but we are hoping at some point um, to expand the collection of these types of atlases uh, that are available in Atlascope and try to get every uh, fire insurance map of Massachusetts included. The Library of Congress has an excellent collection of these maps. You may hear the term Sanborns used to refer to these types of maps. Um, the Sanborn Map Company is the most famous publisher of these maps. Um, though in Boston, we actually have a number of, of them that are, are, are made by other companies. Um, and sometimes Sanborns is just used uh, like as a default term uh, for, for, the, for all of these types of maps. Um, but the Library of Congress Map and Geography Division has a really good digital collection of many, many American cities and towns, they're just not transformed the way that we've done in Atlascope. So this is just an image of the, the actual page. You can imagine this is a, a very, very large page in a, in a very, very large bound atlas. And this shows Ashland in, I believe it's 1912. Yeah, so here's Ashland, Middlesex County, 1912. Got this nice little indicator map. And this is probably the best single piece of evidence we have about the fine scale detail of Ashland in the early 20th century. Working with these at the Library of Congress is sort of a, gives you a sense of what we had to do before we had Atlascope. So here's a little index map that shows the different pages that different parts of the city are on, one, two, three, four, and four. And then we can go to those pages uh, to look at more detail. So we'll go to page two here to look at the area just south of the railroad line. And here you can see in this really incredible detail, here's the passenger station uh, on the Boston Albany, Albany line. You can see the detail about uh, um, water pipes. Uh, again, these are for fire insurers. They wanted to know where water pipes were, a park uh, right along the railroad tracks. Um, and then this really incredible detail about building uses. So this building right here at the corner uh, of, uh, what are these two roads, Summer and, is this Main Street, I think? Um, you can see that it was being used, there was a grocer, barber, and it was a chine, chine, chine laundry, which is, a, you know, a sort of 
uh, quasi racist uh, contraction of a Chinese laundry. Um, see here, we've got a grocer, offices, uh, a GAR hall, that's uh, gonna be the Grand Army of the Republic. We've got a bakery over here. Um, again, details that would have been interesting to fire insurers that had a portable, I assume, oven. Um, I'm not quite sure what the <laughs> contraction port means, uh, but some sort of uh, some sort of oven uh, going on in this bakery. These are all yellow buildings, so very burnable buildings. Livery stables. Um, there's some particular uh, uh, um, symbols on these Sanborn maps. For instance, these numbers two here refer to two stories. And if you were to go back to the first page, um, you can get some details about the um, in this key here about how to read these Sanborn maps and what these different um, what these different symbols mean. So again, number of stories is indicated by a number like that. So this this the Sanborn map of Ashland is is really striking, and 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 we we are hoping to work with some of our partner collections to bring similar um, similar materials in into the library as well into Atlascope as well. Um, the last one I, I want to show you, we actually don't have any 20th century maps of Ashland digitized uh, in our collections, but I, as a reminder that maps are made, are not just these historic deep time objects, but are very much a part of our lives up to the present day. Um, I found this uh, 1962 zoning map of Ashland in the Harvard map collections, digital collections. It was one of the only digitized 20th century maps that I could find. Um, Kind of interesting, a master zoning plan of Ashland in the early 60s. Of course, this is at a time where the railroad is ceasing to be as important of an economic engine and suburbanization is coming to Ashland. Um, so you can see the introduction, for instance, of things like cul-de-sacs, um, developments that are being built for an increasingly automobile uh, uh, world of suburbanites moving out of places like Boston and once again, changing the face of, of a town like Ashland. So I wanna leave you again with this sort of provocation to think about maps, not just as straightforward objects that have answers in them, even though that tends to be how we work with them in our everyday lives, right? We use maps to, to uh, answer questions like how long is my commute gonna be, or where's the nearest Dunkin' Donuts, or how many Dunkin' Donuts are within a quarter mile of me <laughs> in Massachusetts. Um, we ask those kinds of questions and maps all the time. And instead, thinking about maps as these invitations to think about space in our lives and in the past, the, in our collective past. So thinking about environments and landscapes and how societies are organized on a map opens up all sorts of new and interesting questions about framing the past. And those are some of the questions that we're really excited to, to work with people um, to, to think about um, and to use these maps both in, at like the micro scale of, of the histories of your own houses and, and places where you live, as well as how those places are connection, connected to a larger global world. So I wanna save the second half of our presentation for questions. Um, if you're logged in on, uh, on YouTube or Facebook, you should be able to drop questions uh, right into the comment section. Um, and I'm we're happy to take questions about anything. Uh, if, if there are specific questions that we don't have the answer to, we can either sort of try to answer them live, uh, looking, at, looking at some maps for research in, in real time, um, or we're happy to direct the questions to the Historical Society. Um, I'm also going to bring Mina back on at this point, um, who can say a little bit more about what the Ashland Public Library has uh, for historical and research collections, if, if that's helpful as well. So feel free to drop in questions, um, and you know we're we're happy to have a chat. One of the one of the reasons why we we love doing this work is is um, hearing about what what sorts of things people are curious about in the collections. Wow. Thank you, Garrett. That was really, really interesting. Um, and thank you, Megan, for all of the um, links in the in the chat. I have a, I, I do have a question, um, more logistical. Are all of these um, resources free for the public to use? Do we need a BPL library card to access um, the maps that you're talking about? So everything that I've showed you in our digital collections is completely free to use. Um, in fact, all of our digital collections, well, almost all of our digital collections are 
are you can download them at their largest scale and you can make wallpaper out of them. You can uh, you can do whatever you'd like with them. Though we always love to hear how people are using those collections. Um, we don't we don't restrict any of the permissions on our digital collections. Um, of course, the ones that I've showed you from other collections like Library of Congress or Harvard Map Library, um, you'd have to refer to their policies. In terms of the services that we offer to researchers to visit our rare map collections. Those are also free. Um, you just do have to register for a BPL research card, which is free to anybody. You don't need to be a resident of Boston um, to get that card. Um, so we welcome researchers to, you can pull out maps from the 16th century uh, to look at them in our uh, in our reading room. We don't have any 16th century maps of Ashland, uh, unfortunately. Um, but But all of those services are free, as is our exhibition hall, which I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Well, I will definitely be coming to visit that because I do love maps. Um, Cynthia says that she loved this presentation and um, I am so glad that she did. Um, I wanted to ask, um, it, because you don't have that many maps of Ashland and I know that our historical society has a lot that there are not digitized. So is there a way for us to have them digitized through the BPL or um, you know, is there a way to partner around that so that we can get them digitized? Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is uh, speaking specifically to librarians and historical societies. Um, the Digital Commonwealth Fe um, Federation that I that I mentioned that's hosted primarily at the BPL will digitize for free any cultural institution in Massachusetts. Um, Digital Commonwealth has just extraordinary resources from teeny teeny house museums all the way through, you know, UMass and Northeastern libraries. Um, it's really an amazing resource. Digital Commonwealth can both host digitized maps if, 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 if uh, like libraries and societies have taken their own images of them, um, but you can also send materials to the, to the Boston Public Library to be imaged. Um, we have a really amazing team that, that, that digitizes these maps uh, in the library. Okay. So we'll have to we'll have to talk with the historical society about that because obviously you know the smaller libraries don't actually have that capability, but it's such a wonderful way to showcase you know our town. Yes. Um, um, one thing I should actually say as well. Um, so I obviously was focusing on digita digitized collections today, um, since that's what I can show you online, but. Um, you may have caught, I said, we have about 10,000 of our best objects digitized, whereas we have about a quarter million maps in the collections. So you can also search our entire catalog. I'm just showing you here how you would search our entire catalog. And you can see here, you know, we have 64 results that match the search Middlesex County, um, some of which are probably digitized, some of which are digitized, but many more of which are not digitized. Um, so, you know, there, there are many other ways into our collections and many other ways of, of, of finding what's in those collections as well. I always, you know, especially younger people now are so sort of familiar with the like, I type something in the search box and if it comes up, it exists. And if it doesn't come up, it doesn't exist. Um, and, you know, I always like to remind people that humans, librarians, archivists, historical societies are just like incredible resources for the like enormous, enormous amount of interesting material that will never come up in a search box. So asking people, um, our, for instance, our reference librarian here at the MAP Center um, just does a tremendous job um, pulling up interesting objects for specific research questions. And uh, you can file a research question online uh, from our website. Okay. Um, yeah, shout out to the librarians. We definitely like to uh, know what's in our collections. Yes. Uh, so when you were researching for this program, um, oh, actually, um, I'll go with Sheila's question of who was Norman Leventhal? Yeah, thanks, Sheila. That's a great question. Um, so Norman Leventhal um, was a Boston developer and philanthropist um, and map collector. Uh, Norman Leventhal uh, collected a really significant um, set of maps uh, on Boston and of the early Americas. Um, he grew up in Boston and you know did most of his most important work in Boston, so he always loved the city. Um, and in 2004, uh, Norman 
uh, endowed the MAP Center in this public-private partnership um, with the Boston Public Library because he was really committed um, to those collections being available to the public rather than being in a private institution where they'd be more difficult to access. Um, the Leventhal family continues to be really amazing supporters uh, uh, of our work, even though uh, Norman Leventhal has passed on. Um, but the, that 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 uh, initial choice to uh, support the cartographic collections of the BPL um, has really made the the, the BPL and the, and the Leventhal Map Center um, one of the most extraordinary types of geographic public research centers in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, so to go back to my, I uh, started asking a question about uh, when you started doing the research for Ashland, um, what did you discover about how the geography informed the changes over the over the centuries? Yeah, it, that's it's a great question. Um, you know, I was I. Uh, I will confess, I didn't. I, I have been through Ashland before. I grew up in Massachusetts, so I I I, I know it well. Actually, my my family's my extended family is mostly from the Worcester area, so not too far away. Um, but I will confess, I, I didn't know that much about uh, the local geography of Ashland um, before you invited me to this talk. Um, and so, one of the things I found really interesting was that relationship between transport infrastructure, so the Boston Worcester, later Boston Albany Railroad. Um, the way that sort of industrialized this agricultural town. And uh, it's, it doesn't show up, unfortunately, on, on any of the digitized maps I showed you, um, except sort of peripherally in that uh, Harvard map, um, the, the extension of the Mass, the Mass Pike in the 20th century, how that changed the suburban geography, but then also the, the importance of waterways, right? And um, waterways in Ashland, not primarily for navigation, but for... Um, for industrial power, for water power, um, I I did turn up some interesting stuff about the um, aqueduct systems uh, that that you know the reservoirs and this this is the um, water system um, for Boston, uh, which unfortunately uh, looks like our best map for that has not been digitized, and I didn't have a chance to pull it out from the paper collections, um, but it, I, I I did want to know a little bit more about that. Um, reservoir and uh, water resources system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do have some beautiful waterways around here. Um, so um, I don't exactly know when the train came into Ashland, but um, from a map perspective, how would that have an effect on the demographics of Ashland? Yeah, so one of the, one of the great things um, uh, that I think a map can sometimes prompt is questions that are answered by other types of documents. So for instance, um, one thing that we will often do is to take a look at historic census tables. Um, when we're looking, for instance, at that OH Bailey map, which is 1878, we could go to the 1880 census, <coughs> excuse me, and we could look at census tables um, from that time, which would give us information not only about people's names, but their ancestry, their occupation. Um, and this, the, in, in kind of conjunction with that, the Sanborn maps, um, at least these 20th century Sanborn maps, like the one I showed you at the Library of Congress, don't have owner names in it. But many of our Boston uh, real estate atlases do have owner names. And then you can start to look at, OK, who owned this building? Do you see the introduction of, for instance, ethnic names? Like was was there an Irish community or an Italian or German community moving in? Sometimes uh, there'll be a clue on a map, like the presence of a, or, um, like a Catholic church is built, for instance, which is oftentimes a sign that, you know, Irish or Italian immigrants are arriving. Um, and then you can look at census tables and say, okay, you know, this person owned this building and they lived there they were the head of a household. They had, you know, this many kids, they were, they had this occupation. And so the map, I, I like to think of the map almost as like the, like the beginning index of a historical research question. Then you can start to, to pull at it like, okay, well now I have somebody's address. Now I could look in newspaper records. Like is that address mentioned somewhere in, in a newspaper record that I could search? Mm -hmm. um, Cliff says that the, I think he's saying that the trains came into Ashland in 18th, 34. 1834. He's president of our historical society. 
That sounds right. That's a, that's when the, the 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 in the 1830s is when the the Boston Worcester comes into Boston. So I I don't know how long it took to complete the entire route, but mm -hmm. the 1830s is the the beginning of the, of those lines. They have we know them well because the that those railroads um, uh, made a made a crisscross across the Back Bay, which was still tidal estuary at the time, and it really. Um, sped up the process of filling the Back Bay estuary into land, um, which is where the library is now located on on, on filled former tidal estuary. Mm -hmm. That same train line that, that runs through Ashland uh, assisted in that process. Mm -hmm. um, so you had said that you don't have maps of Ashland from like the 1600s. Is that that you don't have them digitized or you we don't actually have any? There's not a ton of what you would consider like proper maps uh, at the town scale, um, certainly from the 17th century. And there aren't even that many from the 18th century. Um, one thing to remember is that like surveying and cartography are very niche, difficult techniques and professions, um, you know, all the way into the 20th century. Um, so, geographic documents were produced as they were needed. For a place like Ashland, primarily what would have been needed would have been like land surveys of like individual property. Um, so I am certain that either in your collections or elsewhere, we could find land surveys and land deeds and land titles. Um, once uh, later, uh, you know, in the 17th and certainly in the 18th century, when we get to the Seven Years' War and the American Revolution, warfare becomes a really important reason for making maps. So many of our most important maps of that period are, are executed by armies and navies mm -hmm. um, in order to do the work of the uh, conquest or, uh, you know, um, ruling a colonial empire. Places like Ashland that were not <laughs> that were not you know uh, at the center of of battles uh, don't get mapped as much. We have a very famous series of coastline charts that were used by the British Navy, um, and they actually don't have much detail beyond the coast because if you're a uh, you know a, na a navy captain, you need to know how to get your ship in and out of the harbor, but you don't need much more detail than that. Um, so it's not really until the 19th century that we get a lot of um, sort of mass production cartography at the scale of, of the town. Mm -hmm. And we're getting some history from Cliff and Sean. Um, Ashland was created from Framingham, Hopkinton, and Holliston in 1846, primarily due to the arrival of the train. Yeah. And Sean says Ashland itself was considered part of the Framingham plantation in the 1600s. What does that mean? Yeah, so what it's actually another good uh, cl clue about research, right? Um, Massachusetts, colonial Massachusetts, as well as colonial um, the Plymouth Colony, which is um, you know southeastern Massachusetts around um, uh, uh, around Plymouth. Um, <laughs> their land is originally granted to to large groups of proprietors. Um, by the British crown. And then it's slowly subdivided into uh, th those towns go through a process almost like of a cell dividing as they get more populous and as new population centers appear in them. So for instance, um, uh, like the, the Charlestown, uh, just north of the river from Boston, its original borders stretched like deep into Middlesex County and many of the towns kind of north and northwest of, of that today were carved out of the original patent for, for Charlestown. Um, so when we're thinking about research, actually, if we wanted to go back to 17th century maps, we wouldn't want to look for the term Ashland um, uh, because it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't be on the title of anything. We'd want to look at, for instance, Framingham um, or whatever like the predecessor uh, jurisdictions were. Of course, there's people living here long before um, uh, long before the British set it up as a colony. Um, one of the challenges, of course, is that we have very, very few extant paper records of native people's um, geographies, which is not to say that they didn't have geographies. They had very sophisticated understandings of their local geography. Um, but we just don't have a lot of that uh, uh, surviving as, as artifacts. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Megan just put this awesome uh, map of the plant of Framingham plantations in 16. Yeah, I, I see. Let's, let's see if I can bring it up. It's cool. Let's see. Very cool. This is why we love doing live research because you <laughs> find cool stuff. Yeah, interesting. So I can tell already this is not made in 1699, just from the look of it. So this map's actually made in the early 20th century. Mm. Um, but it so this would be like a, a replica of a map of the Framingham plantation in 1699. Um, and so what are we looking at here? Look at the legend. So bounds of far of Danforth's farms, Thomas Ames's land, and Gookin and Howe's land. So let's try to get oriented here. Where's the Sudbury River? There it is. Yeah, so this is really interesting. There's Waits Farm. That's I guess bounded by these hatch marks, mm -hmm. Thomas Ames's land. There are the ponds, ministerial lands. So this is an, another interesting feature of early New England. Um, 17th century uh, in England is undergoing a revolution in land use that's moving away from sort of common field system of agriculture. But the, col the English colonists in New England replicate essentially pre-modern feudal land division techniques like setting aside things called glebe lands or ministerial lands that were to support a minister or to support schools um so you can see here the, this land uh on the the northwest side of the Sudbury river would have been set aside as ministerial lands and the meeting house built right there that's very cool i'm, I'm here's an example i didn't i didn't even <laughs> i didn't find this when i was looking for uh, uh ashland maps um because I wasn't looking for uh, I wasn't looking for Framingham, so very very cool map. Yep. Actually, Sean says that there's a map of Framingham in 1699 in your collection that shows the Saville Simpson property by Cold Spring Brook. I wonder if that's the same one. For I bet it is. Because it would be see. kind of cool to have another map of 1699, right? Yeah, I I suspect this is probably it. Um. Somebody's gonna have to tell me where Cold Spring Brook is. Down. Wow, it's really fascinating, though. Yeah, this might be a little more difficult that we can than we can oh. do in in real time here, but it's the same map near the bottom. <coughs> near the bottom, where is Cold Spring Brook? Do, do, ah, there it is, Cold Spring Brook. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, so you you can tell just by the look of this map that it it the, it, the map itself is not from 1699 but it is a map of 1699. That is amazing that you can like sort of on the spot find something of interest. Yeah. And that somebody in our uh, one of our attendees has actually visited this map either digitally or in person. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is really suggestive too here so I mentioned we don't have a lot of maps that actually gesture to the presence of uh, of um, native populations. This one does, Indian lands. So, you know, what was beyond this patent line <clears throat> would have still been recognized as not enclosed English colonial land granted by the crown, but instead Indian lands. Um, so, you know, certainly the people colonizing this area were very well aware that other people lived here. Um, but it tends to be confined to the margins of the map. Again, thinking about why did they make these maps? They didn't make, these colonists did not make these maps out of, uh, you know, anthropological interest in native peoples. They made it to claim territory and to show where their borders and where their bounds of their lands were. Mm -hmm. Just amazing. <laughs> I'm like trying to look at it really closely. Um, also, Cliff had mentioned earlier that some of the fill for back bay, Boston's Back Bay came from Ashland. Yep. Ashland and Hopkinton Reservoirs were created. The fill was transported by rail to the Back Bay. So. Yes, exactly. That same line. They had they built special cars that could sort of just tip over and dump fill right into Back Bay, um, since it was right off of the the line as the as that railroad came into Boston. Mm -hmm. I would say that probably a lot of the rural communities probably have that 
claim to fame as well. I see Cliff and Sean have both noted that the the Indian lands referred to in that might was um, the what, what was called a praying Indian town. So praying Indians were Indians that had converted either forcibly or voluntarily to Christianity, um, and they were given some rights by the the crown essentially in return for their religious conversion. Um, called Magunko, uh, uh, says Sean and Cliff. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so since we don't have a lot of maps between then and, you know, the 1800s, as you say, we don't really know how how quickly they got pushed out of those areas through a map. We would know it through, like, other information. Yeah, the, that those processes of enclosure and expropriation are oftentimes like revealed in maps by their absence, right? So <clears throat> especially when we look at continental scale maps of the United States, the way that Indian names and Indian occupants is steadily erased from that ma the, those maps. Um, looking at documents like treaty negotiations, um, deeds. Uh, we actually, the, the Rare Books Department of the Boston Public Library has some of the original deeds mm -hmm. that were signed um, where Indians, um, quit claimed uh, parts of Boston, um, again, like someone under duress. Um, so looking at other documents to to think about what those what that colonial process involved in terms of coercion, in terms of um, you know the forced removal of the, the prior occupants of the land. Mm -hmm. um, I just have one more question, and that is, uh, so now with like the current ways of mapping, you know, Google Maps is everywhere, drones, yep. you know, um, how does that affect what you do in terms of mapping regions and finding the histories of them as we go forward? Yeah, so we are we work all the time now with digital maps. Um, that includes digitized historic maps, like the ones that you've seen today. Um, it includes digitally transforming historic maps, like in Atlas scope. So all of those maps have to be warped by a computer to fit on top of a modern map. Um, but we also work a lot with contemporary maps and geographic data. Um, so one thing, whoops, I just stopped sharing my screen. Let me do it again. Um, I'll just show you a project that we have been working on. Um, we're trying to make it much easier whoops, to for people to access geographic data um, on topics that include historic topics. So for instance, we've made geographic data on Boston's changing shoreline available online um, in our new data portal. And you can bring this into modern map making software and make a digital map of Boston overlaid with its historic shoreline. And that lets you do things like, for instance, um, count up like how many people in Boston today live on land that was water in 1630. Um, and then we also, you know, we are interested in all sorts of questions around like um, demographic data. This is an interesting data set we did around internet access and um, in Boston, many of our pro programs are focused around stuff that we do with with educators, K twelve students, and adult patrons. Um, but we offer we have a, a assistant curator for digital geography who does a lot of work with with people um, helping out, you know, on digital projects and digital map making. So that's very much a part of our our world as well at the Map Center. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I'm a librarian and I actually didn't know that such a resource, um, such an expansive resource was available to us. So thank you so much for taking the time to show us our maps and to talk about what you do. Yeah, thanks so much for the invitation. I'm really, well, you know, one of the things that that is like the most rewarding for us is, you know, starting from this really amazing stuff we have, which are like, old you know old stuff right and that tends to be people's first way into our collections like you have old things about uh about massachusetts 
Um, and then opening up how much of a bigger world geography can be, right? Thinking about geography, not just as this like old stuff, um, but really as a way of seeing the world and, and, and investigating the world. So we'd love to both have you, Mina, anyone from the Historical Society um, or anyone tuned in, um, we'd love to have you to the library at any time, um, again, for a visit to the exhibition or to our research center. I also just want to note that uh, if you're tuned in today, we'd love to just get your feedback on today's program. Um, we use feedback to help us shape future programs and and, and think about what, what people might like to see more of or less of, hopefully not too much less of anything. <laughs> oh, no, I think we'll always want more. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, you know, uh, I really want to thank everybody who's here because I think on YouTube, Facebook, I think it's just really great that your interest is there and that you continue to teach people coming into Ashland more and more about the town, which is such a wonderful little town. Yeah, it's really, it was a pleasure to, to get to know Ashland a little bit better and I hope I'll have a chance to, to visit the library soon as well. Absolutely. And maybe when we're finally in person someday, you could come back and we could do this all over again. Sounds like a plan. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in, everybody. And thanks again, Mina, for the invite. Absolutely. Good night.